Um, okay, I want to introduce uh, our last speaker, Dugu Tunch, who is also one of the co organizers here, of course. Um, so, Dugu uh, got a PhD in philosophy in, at the University of Heidelberg and the University of Helsinki. Uh, she's a philosopher who's uh, um, interested in epistemology, philosophy of science, philosophy of the social sciences, and I think especially psychology. Um, she is currently a Marie Curie uh, fellow, uh, has a, a Marie Curie uh, grant uh, hosted by the, um, uh, by the Middle East Te uh, Technical University in Ankara, Ankara and also at, the UC Ir at UC Irvine, where she was just uh, for half a year. And uh, she's going to start as a postdoc at TU Eindhoven at the, uh, in philosophy uh, now in September, or as soon as possible, I understand. Um, uh, I think Du does really uh, super interesting work. I just wanted to, uh, I think uh, uh, Daniel Larkins on the first day mentioned this uh, concept of uh, uh, philosophy of science and epistemology being useful for scientists. And I think Google's work is a great example uh, for this. I think she's written uh, super interesting stuff that I, as a, uh, a psychologist, meta scientist, uh, have found extremely useful. Uh, especially in, part of, in a part of her work uh, that I would call um, uh, a, a, a group uh, around her that I would call the last falsification, maybe. Uh, I don't know. We have a different name for it, but for another occasion. <laughs> what, what's the uh, what's name? Uh, but we are on record. I will tell it off the record. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but anyway, so in, in this line, uh, she has uh, worked, for example, on uh, auxiliary hypotheses in the context of uh, replication, which has been a big topic in the replication crisis, whether replication studies fail due to failed auxiliaries, uh, for example, um, and uh, about dichotomous claims. Um, but uh, she's also more broadly interested in social aspects of scientific knowledge and properties of epistemic systems. Um, in scientific justification and epistemic competence and responsibility in science, and is currently in her project working on extended scientific virtue, but he's working on an uh, account of collective epistemic virtue advice as applied to scientific communities. And I'm uh, super happy to uh, excited to hear your talk. So. So thank you very much for this like wonderful uh, intro that I didn't expect actually. Uh, thanks a lot. So you know me more from my methodological work. I hope you don't hate this one. Uh, uh, yeah, this is my title. Uh, this is a work in progress paper uh, co authored with Duncan Richard at UC Irvine. Um, and yeah, since this is a work in progress paper, some of the ideas are really half baked, and I'm really looking for uh, substantial input from you and other people before I turn, into a, turn it into a, my last word. Uh, so let's begin. So this is my question for today. So we have sort of been uh, re referring to this question in like other terminologies and or different ways. Uh, I just throw up the, these days. Uh, and I guess it is sort of the central, one of the central questions uh, for us. So uh, the relationship between uh, individual and collective dimensions of uh, epistemic virtue and we refer to collective, but I call it collective epistemic virtue more uh, in terms of scientific progress. So I, you can like understand the, this as, interchange, as an interchangeable term for scientific progress. If uh, the term epistemic sounds like awkward to you, I totally understand that. Uh, so this is the question. Uh, and I want to refer back to actually Mike's talk, which was, uh, I was really afraid yesterday that he would totally scoop my talk, but <laughs> then I was pleased that he totally ventured into uh, a different direction with like wild speculations and <laughs> solutions and so on, which, uh, uh, which is like, quite a different direction that I'm uh, gonna go with this, but the starting point is similar. So remember he talked about the cycles of disenchantment. And he began with the, um, the first cycle of disenchantment or the first part, uh, so the beginning uh, of disenchantment was in the latter half of the 20th century where uh, people began to think that scientists are not exceptional individuals. Uh, what I call traditionalism is the idea actually that fell victim to that disenchantment there. Uh, and Mike called it status quo. Uh, so I framed this question uh, as one which refers to the relationship between epistemic virtuous communities and epistemic virtuous individuals. So I think this is a useful frame. Uh, and I had identified two positions as marking the extreme ends of this debate. So this is not historical, this is 
purely conceptual. So on the one hand, we have this traditional uh, position or the conservative position that uh, individual epistemic virtue is necessary and sufficient for uh, collective epistemic virtue or scientific progress or success as a scientific collective. On the other hand, extreme end, we have a recently much more popular position that individual virtue is neither necessary nor sufficient for scientific progress or collective scientific virtue. And even individual vice can sometimes possibly contribute to the collective success of science. And let's call this uh, virtue radicalism. So this is how like both uh, envision the relationship between the individual uh, and the collective levels. So let me just briefly talk about what I mean by epistemic and collective words. You just translated into like human language. Uh, so I understand epistemic virtue as a reliable cognitive competence uh, in, in the ways that are relevant to science that are exercised with an intrinsic concern for truth or knowledge. So it has a competence and responsibility aspect. Uh, by competence, I mean skills, traits, or habits, cognitive skills, traits, or habits that are relevant for scientific inquiry. Uh, you can view it as an ability in general. Uh, and by uh, this intrinsic concern for truth or knowledge, I mean a, a responsible motivational state uh, that, is, uh, that serves proper conduct of scientific inquiry. So many people treat actually this concept of responsibility as an ethical or moral concept. Actually, as Mike also did, I guess. Uh, but I see it as an essential part of epistemic or intellectual virtue. I see it as an epistemic concept in this context. Uh, because um, responsibility is actually a core part of uh, how we sort of evaluate or value competence. Like if we have a perfectly sort of skillful, able, uh, able scientist who has like no, this, no regard, no serious concern for truth or knowledge, uh, we would be rather disinterested in that kind of skill or ability. Uh, and that might even be worse because they can use that skill or ability in ways that we as public or other sort of scientists or other academic fields do not want uh, them to use. So they, they can prevent uh, collective success. Uh, so in that way, um, responsibility is part of uh, the concept of com com uh, competence as we are interested in. So yeah. Uh, Let's go on. Uh, and epistemic wise, the concept of epistemic wise is like sort of a derivative notion uh, on the notion of epistemic virtue. And it means just dis dispositions, intellectual or cognitive dispositions that consistently produce bad scientific outputs or which stand systematically in the way of proper inquiry. So this can mean a uh, culpable incompetence, like sort of lacking the abilities or skills you are supposed to uh, or obligated to have. Uh, in terms of your like service position as a scientist, uh, or you claim to have what you don't have, uh, or uh, improper motivational states which systematically stand in the way of proper inquiry, so like violation of uh, norms of scientific integrity and so on. So an epistemically vicious scientist uh, is someone who uh, is, as I said, culpably incompetent or negligent towards norms of proper inquiry, and that means. They might ignore counter evidence, they might report false findings, they can make um, uh, unwarranted scientific inferences or bad scientific inferences, engages in, uh, engaging in bad or very uh, problematic research practices, uh, very irrationally clinging to bad theories or models, uh, in the worst case, falsifying or fabricating data. So this is how I understand that the individual level of uh, epistemic virtue. Uh, at the collective level, uh, so this is not a one-to-one -one analogy, of course. Uh, at the collective level, I'm uh, more uh, focused on reliable production of uh, good scientific outcomes. Uh, so uh, a virtuous scientific community is a progressive, scientifically progressive community. So this is, I guess, a straightforward uh, understanding. And an epistemically vicious community is one which not only lacks a progressive character, but uh, because this might happen due to lots of 
uh, different reasons, uh, but also consistently produces bad epistemic outcomes. And what I mean by that, like they produce a high proportion of erroneous or false findings in, in their scientific literature, for example, or they have widely accepted but wrong or very useless theories or models, or they have very ineffective outputs, such as like treatments, interventions, or scientific advice for uh, social policy. So, this was just a detour to explain the concepts I'm going to use. Uh, so, just remember I mentioned these two extremes, uh, traditionalism and radicalism, about this relationship between individual and collective virtue. And I I'm going to focus on uh, what I call virtue radicalism, so the sort of the, the more reductionist uh, sort of position. Uh, and we have quite famous arguments uh, here, like uh, the, this radicalist position has been defended, especially in the philosophy and sociology of science via uh, quite a rich range of arguments. Uh, and these explain the success of science, science in terms of its social structure. So you can see these as structural arguments for scientific progress or scientific success. Uh, the economic, what I call the economic argument, I call it economic because it's based on an invisible, invisible man, uh, hand mechanism, uh, mostly. So it is most famously depended by uh, Hall and, and Kitcher. Uh, we have seen mentions to the, the, these works before. Uh, and the sociological argument uh, is, although it is very different from the economical <clears throat> argument, it arrives the same conclusion of virtue radicalism that I identified by a different way. And it is most famously defended by the uh, sociologist of science, Merton. So this economic argument crux is that it maintains the success of science is primarily due to the incentive structures in its credit economy. So thanks to this, these structures, scientists can serve collective epistemic good by pursuing non-epistemic goals like esteem, recognition, or career advancement. And the sociological argument uh, arrives at the same con conclusion by like maintaining that scientists behave in a way that serves the institutional uh, goals of science and aims of science, not because they are particularly virtuous people, like epistemically, uh, but because they only comply with the norms and rules enjoined by the scientific institutions. So these norms uh, and sanctions are the real cause behind uh, scientific success, or maybe behind scientific failure, uh, collective failure in some cases. So yeah, here's my argument. So I'll argue that individual epistemic virtue is an important component and a valid explanatory factor of scientific progress. So this is not a, a very cool position to defend nowadays, but I wanted to just say this and just tell me if this is not a very good idea to defend. Uh, I'm open to be persuaded, but so here's the argument. Individual factors, fact, facts having to do with the intellectual or epistemic characters of scientists deserve much more serious attention. Uh, and uh, although we have learned a lot by focusing on structural factors throughout all these years, uh, we didn't arrive at sufficient, I think, explanations of uh, scientific success by focusing on structure. We shouldn't lose focus on individual factors and uh, character, intellectual character related factors. So in uh, more precisely, the argument is, uh, goes like this. So this is what we have learned from uh, this history of structural uh, arguments about scientific progress. So individual epistemic virtue is definitely not sufficient for scientific progress. Uh, there are lots of different factors that might affect uh, collective success. And even though you have like excellent scientists, you might end up with uh, a different arrangement of research teams or science policy, you might arrive at a very suboptimal uh, collective results. So that's one of the lessons we've learned, I guess. Uh, and we also learned that scientific communities are not determined so bottom up. So they have uh, means to tolerate a significant amount of deviant behavior. Uh, but also in, in some cases, they might even have the means to benefit from deviant behavior. So uh, there are lots of emergent processes uh, here at play. So this is also what we have learned. Uh, this is what I will sort of argue. Uh, a sort of toned down, uh, more uh, sort of 
uh, let's say, domesticated version of the virtual uh, traditionalist position. So we don't need uh, a scientific community full of uh, very virtuous scientists, but we definitely need to have a significant proportion of virtuous scientists in the community in order to have collective success. So this is my argument, uh, which means that facts about the social structure of science can at, mo at most be partial explanations of collective success. And like most of the sort of material I, I, I use uh, will come from the uh, facts related to the credibility crisis. So I will arrive at this conclusion very indirectly by examining uh, arguments for virtual radicalism. And I will sort of propose why I, why I object several of those arguments. So let's begin with the argument from the invisible head. Uh, so there's a considerable literature, as I said, which uh, rely on this invisible uh, hand arguments. And it, uh, they, most of them have uh, sort of the same set of premises. So the general structure of the, these invisible hand arguments is that a decentralized social process results in an outcome that is not intended by the participating agents. So, and quoting from Ray, uh, another quite well-cited author in this literature, a particular outcome is uh, an unintended consequence of the intentional behavior of a number of individuals, and the individuals uh, like might have one end in mind, uh, so they have a certain aim, uh, and they act according to that aim, but their concerted efforts give rise to a consequence that was no part of their intentions, so we have uh, an unintended consequence at the collective level. Uh, so applied to the context of science, that means, in the words of how, uh, that scientists primarily seek credit, not knowledge, uh, or some other reward, like it may not be credit, but credit might be a, a sort of uh, means to get those rewards. Uh, and in doing so, they advance scientific knowledge. So he thinks that scientists do not advance scientific knowledge by aiming to uh, or willing to advance scientific knowledge. They do so by seeking credit. Uh, so the credit economy of science miraculously gives rise to collective virtue as if it is intentionally designed that way. So it is like the typical invisible head argument. So the social structure uh, that creates this invisible hand uh, sort of mechanism is called uh, the priority rule or the winner take all market. Uh, so it is commonly analyzed in this way. So uh, the pro what is famously called the priority rule in science means that in the words of Stevens, uh, that rewards to scientists are allocated solely on the basis of actual achievement uh, rather than effort or talent investors. So not the process at all, but just having the right outcome. Uh, and no discovery of a fact or procedure, but the first counts as an actual achievement. So if you are just even one day too late, you, your, your, your effort doesn't count at all. Uh, so that's why this is a winner take all credit market. And one result of uh, this priority rule uh, for these people uh, is the system of mutual citation. So it is another characteristic of uh, science, which is mostly due to the priority rule. Uh, and uh, this means that the priority rule or the structure of this winner take all credit market incentivizes originality, speed, and impact. Uh, and in order to uh, do those like uh, to produce those outcomes, you have to uh, get your work accepted by your uh, peers. So you have to produce work, but you have to get your work accepted by others. So uh, you know, in order to get credit, and what do you do in order to get others accept your work? You build on previous work. So you build on credible, uh, rigorous, or well-established previous work. So when you do that, you have to cite previous work. Uh, in order to get cited by others. So since you like cite previous work, you become interested in its reliability. So you wouldn't want to cite erroneous 
for weak research, you want to cite credible, solid research. So that's how uh, scientific self-correction occurs, sort of according to this perspective. So it occurs as an sort of emergent mechanism due to competition for credit. So the crux of these arguments is that actually epistemic virtue, uh, so virtuous, uh, virtuous intentions and selfish credit seeking are behaviorally indistinguishable. So it is the miracle of this uh, credit market or its structure that if you, even if you like put in a, uh, somebody completely vicious or you put some, some, somebody uh, like completely virtuous in the same system, they will behave exactly in the same way. So that's sort of the miracle of, of this uh, structure. So, first objection. So this invisible hand mechanism is involved as a causal model to explain the success of science, but a serious flaw in uh, its justification is in any causal model uh, that they took like the proponents or the people who have proposed this view, they looked only at science at its most successful and abstracted out uh, some social interaction patterns to explain that success. This is not a very good, good way to go because a good test for the model would involve looking at less impressive cases to see whether they feature the same or different incentive structures. And the credibility crisis and the increased attention to the effect of uh, the present incentive structures on research quality and reliability revealed a critical anomaly for this model. Uh, so the same reward system not only failed to work as the proponents of invisible hand described uh, in some fields, but also correlated with highly undesirable epistemic outcomes like uh, unrepredictable findings, low methodological standards, publication bias, and unacceptably high rate of false positive in scientific literature as a consequence. Uh, so the root causes of this credibility crisis have been widely traced back to uh, established but faulty research practices, commonly called questionable research practices. I guess I don't need to explain what those mean in such, a, uh, such an audience. So here are probably uh, arguments that you're very familiar with. Uh, so people have argued in the, on the meta science side that institutional incentive structures undermine rather than serve the aims of science. Uh, so they also like offered mechanisms. So uh, the aim of collecting publishable results most efficiently leads to QRPs, which leads to inflated effects and increased false positive rates in the literature or high competition uh, or just rewarding of the publication count and emphasis on novelty and originate, or the originality leads to a proliferation of methodological practices. We also saw this reference. Uh, philosophers also talked about this. Uh, so he said, um, in a paper argued that the incentive structures uh, make low replicability of findings inevitable because they incentivize scientists to focus on speed and impact. So it was a, based on a simulation. Uh, so they focus on, when they focus on speed and impact at the expense of, uh, expense of replicability, this is what you will get. Uh, and uh, Felipe also had a, a sort of resonant argument uh, that there's a normative tension uh, within this credit system of science between novelty and replicability. And uh, it is uh, like uh, the balance is on uh, novelty and not on replicability. And Bragg also had a uh, sort of resonant argument uh, in re uh, reference to fraud that the incentive structures uh, encourage fraud. So there also have been lots of obviously calls for intervention and reform. And uh, they've been speaking of what I call virtuous interventions, epistemically virtuous interventions in the current economy of science to adjust the rules of the game, or even to increase governance of science by strengthening institutional gatekeeping and introducing sanctions, more sanctions to better enforce scientific norms. And of course, like such ideas, the idea of virtuous interventions uh, doesn't make like very good bedfellows with the idea of invisible heads. And uh, we can even go further, uh, this is from Leo, uh, we can even say that uh, the whole idea of achieving collective ends through the pursuit of individual interests might be taken because it creates a conflict between uh, what is individual's interest and what is uh, the, in the interest of science. So the whole idea must be, it uh, might be, uh, 
from the conceit from the start. So this was like my first introductory objection. Let's come to the second one. So epistemic virtue and credit seeking is actually, they are actually behaviorally or consequentially distinguishable uh, when you uh, play with, uh, I don't have a simulation here, but like merely a conceptual argument, when you play with contextual variables. Uh, what I mean, like, let's have these three characters, just a conceptual <laughs> play. Uh, so these are, I don't call like epistemic or intellectual characters, not like personality traits. But we have this, uh, we know these types, like we have this law from good scientist who is uh, interested in advancing human knowledge, revealing nature's secrets and so on. So it has an interesting concern for truth or knowledge. Um, so they might, uh, I'm not claiming that they have no, they have total disregard for credit or what happens with promotions and so on. Uh, but even if they have a credit motivation, uh, it doesn't, uh, it is not part of the motivational explanation of why they do what they do in terms of their research practice. So it is a credit motivation is not a salient motivational explanation for why they choose method X over Y, why they decide to build on that part of the scientific literature and not that part, why they choose uh, to publish their results or wait and conduct a few side, uh, studies more and the way they communicate their results and so on. So uh, they might have a great motivation. I don't, uh, I don't argue against that, but this is not a salient motivational explanation of their research behavior. So this is how I uh, see uh, the paradigm example of virtuous scientist. So this is a more sort of commonplace character. I would say the chaotic good type. Uh, so truth or knowledge is definitely a significant concern for them, uh, but maybe not the only or the primary concern. So uh, the kind of good scientists wouldn't uh, engage in fraud or fabrication of data, but they might maybe oversell their uh, sort of research. Uh, so they might be influenced, they might be more open to the effect of incentive structures deter in determining their research topics, for example, or picking their research methods. Although they wouldn't go as far as um, committing obvious uh, obviously uh, deviant behavior or uh, breaches of scientific integrity. Uh, but we, we see a, we have an influence there, here. This is the whole idea. Uh, so their choice of methods is not solely guided by the reliability of those methods. Uh, and they might be more open to self-serving bias uh, in scientific reasoning. So whenever you have, and we have lots of uh, degrees of freedom in uh, making research choices, and then we have lots of uncertainty and in those sort of points or uh, opportunities of uncertainty, they might be, uh, even when they don't know that they do so, they might have some self-serving biases in the way that, for example, they increase the publishability of their results. Uh, and they would be less inclined to engage their law reward activities like conducting replications, doing very uh, rigorous uh, peer review, uh, or doing other kind of um, support activities that which uh, do not directly result in scientific outcomes. So we have roughly the chaotic neutral types, and this is like simply doesn't have any significant epistemic motivation, only a credit motivation. So uh, engages in uh, good scientific pra practice only if it is practically or instrumentally rational to do so if there's a good payoff. Uh, of course, they have a higher risk of misbehavior. Uh, I will call this type a potential free rider if the circumstances are right. So this is like the type which is most open to the influence of incentive structures. So uh, when we are trying to have like a model, economic model of uh, the effect of in incentive structures, this is usually the type we have in mind as sort of our assumption. This is like the homo economicus of, this is like the rational scientist, but practically rational, uh, not epistemic rational. So this scientist maximizes epistemic rationality. This scientist is both, has like lots, a mixture of aims, and this maximizes practical or instrumental or economic rationality, I would say. And so as I try to like sort of convince you, they will have a, a divergent behavioral repertoire 
depending on what, what is happening in their field. So whether there is good scientific quality control, whether there are uh, higher thresholds for publication, whether there is high sanctions, high deterrence for uh, misbehavior and so on. So those will uh, change a difference. Uh, those will affect the difference, especially in the behavior of these uh, chaotic sort of uh, scientists. Third one. Uh, so social structure of science is not a sufficient explanation of uh, scientific progress. So I will rely on Ray to begin with. Uh, he uh, advanced a criticism of Paul's uh, invisible hand argument, uh, and he proposed that so it was like sort of a uh, part, 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 partial criticism. He said that this invisible hand um, argument has to be combined with what he calls a hidden hand argument. So it goes like this. The scientific institutions are intentionally designed in a way that scientists' pursuit of credit contributes unintentionally to scientific knowledge generation. So uh, he is on the same page with Holmes, assuming that scientists only motivate, are, are motivated by credit. So they have, there's nothing exceptional about them. Uh, but global epistemic motivations are not completely out of the picture. They are a serious explanation at the level of uh, the origination of scientific institutions and incentive structures, because they were designed intentionally by epistemically virtuous people with a view to scientific progress. So that's how they, uh, that's why they work this good. So that, that's race uh, sort of version. I think we can go further than this because Ray assumes that it, in the sort of origin, there were these uh, noble aims and noble motivations which went into uh, designing of these incentive structures and the reward system and the credit economy of science. And then it unfolded sort of automatically from that point on. But this is not usually what happens. Uh, like markets, the scientific credit economy uh, need continuous interventions, what I call virtuous interventions, to keep them on a progressive track. Because science changes. Science is not something static that you can have the rules of the game once and uh, like there's no reflectivity involved, there's no dynamism involved, there's no like structural changes involved. So it is not like that. So it, it is a very dynamic system. So you need continuous interventions, not only at the start. Uh, and how can you have continuous interventions in a way that is uh, conducive to scientific progress if you only have the chaotic neutral type, but only the virtuous scientists at the origination. So you constantly need uh, sort of guardians of scientific values if you follow that model, because you would need interventions. And this is not only to uh, keep scientists in, in, in the good track, like scientific infra uh, infrastructure, technologies in the society changes all the time, and scientists respond to incentives. So when you introduce something, they respond to it, and it might totally end up in a way that you haven't designed or not, not wanted. So there has to be a much more dynamic interaction between uh, sort of the policy making side of things and responding uh, to incentive structures uh, sort of side of things. And you definitely need virtuous interventions continuously. So, and I call these people uh, who would make uh, or feel the need to do virtuous interventions guardians of scientific goals and values. So it sounds too noble, but yeah, it's also what we are trying to do right now. So let's maybe elaborate a little bit uh, why I think so. Because external reward systems, by their nature, incentivize gaining work for you, I think. Like any external reward system, there's no uh, perfect reward system that is like totally uh, proof against incentivizing gaming work for you, I think. It is in their nature. And this cannot be completely prevented. Uh, and there's no social mechanism for scientific quality control and gatekeeping that can be completely fail safe. We can't have uh, like peer review that is 100% fail safe. It is impossible because trust is a inalienable constituent of science. Science is not designed that way. And I really seriously doubt that it can be designed that way. Uh, science really has a structural element which we can liken to trust. So when scientific institutions were designed in the first place, and even now in their sort of current functioning, we rely a lot on trust and the trustworthiness of scientists. And when you take that out of the picture, many things start to uh, collapse. 
It's not a system that is designed strategically. So that's what I mean. <laughs> that's why maintaining the critical, what I call significance ratio of lawful good scientists is necessary to uphold scientific values and preserve the epistemic reliability of, of scientific institutions. Otherwise, scientific institutions would be would go on a path of epistemic corruption. So this is the second argument, but it is again an economic argument. The second version, I would say, it's slightly different version of the, uh, the same argument. And this says that science can be success. So it is not only the case that virtuous behavior and mayor credit seeking are not indistinguishable. Science can be successful even when scientists behaviorally deviate from epistemic rationality. And this is famously due to Kitcher. Uh, he said that it is possible that there should be a mismatch between the demands of individual rationality and those of collective or uh, community rationality, and a better distribution of cognitive labor would include a diversity of <coughs> strategies, including epistemically irrational ones. And what he means by epistemically irrational ones is, for example, the choice of worse methods uh, as far as uh, the current knowledge in the field is concerned. So a consequence they draw from uh, the teacher draws from this argument is that the community of credit seekers, pure credit seekers, like this Hobbesian scientific community, would fare better than one of noble, high-minded scientific inquirers. So that's the conclusion. Uh, and he sort of elaborates on this conclusion by saying that the thirst for fame and fortune might actually play a constructive role in our community uh, epistemic projects. So our social institutions within science might take advantage of our personal fables to channel them towards collectively uh, beneficial ends. So what I will say with respect to this is that this argument, it has lots of valid points, uh, but it focuses on the context of discovery and disregards the context of justification. Uh, these are like right ones, uh, classical terms for to refer to uh, actually not easily separable aspects of scientific inquiry. So, so context of discovery has to do with uh, the initial formulation of hypotheses, uh, exploration, so the, uh, sort of uncharted, the charting uncharted territories, uh, discovering new phenomena and so on. And the context of justification is the empirical uh, validation of uh, what you have found basically. So theory testing, hypothesis testing, and so on. And I say that these have uh, two different associated value systems actually. So the context of discovery might well benefit from qualities like ambitiousness, epistemic risk-taking, so like going for irrational uh, methods and so on prestige seeking, self-interestedness. So these qualities might, uh, although not guaranteed, but they might well contribute to uh, the success of science in the context of discovery. So the ideal type uh, for discovery purposes would be the well-awarded scientist. Uh, but the context of justification is different. Uh, here we have uh, much less room for diversity, actually, because the aims and the interests of science are much, much more clear in this context. So we don't have uh, that amount of uncertainty of what will be good. We have a like, more clear definition, uh, understanding of bad research practices and good research practices. Uh, and in the context of justification, the values uh, we will want to see are like epistemic diligence, critical thinking, uh, intellectual humility, so not overselling your results, for example, uh, so disinterestedness, impartiality. So these are traditionally all uh, intellectual virtues that we associate with virtuous scientists. So these have a crucial role to play in the context of justification, uh, although they might even maybe hamper progress in, in, in terms of uh, discovery. So what I say is that we cannot maximize both uh, productivity and reliability within a single value system. So there is a normative tension or value tension within science, which is inbuilt into uh, the practice of scientific inquiry itself. So this is not something you can have different groups for even. Like a single study has both discovery and justification aspects. So what I mean is there's always a trade-off. 
And if we sort of bet all our uh, money on promoting one value system, we will definitely get where uh, we desire to get. So lastly, the sociological argument. Uh, how many minutes I have? Five. Done? Huh? Done? Uh, five. Oh, more than enough. This is my last slide, apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> so the sociological argument. So this is like, uh, so it sounds very different, but I claim that it sort of arrives at uh, the same conclusion with regards to the relationship of individual and collective factors. Uh, so Merton famously says that, so this is like the sociological perspective itself. So this is not like a particular conclusion, but maybe even the starting point. So if scientists behave uh, in sort of ways that seem exceptional, like they try to advance knowledge, they want to help, they try to help society and sort of they, they're doing things which are in everybody's epistemic and practical benefit. But if they do that, they're not doing this because of their distinctive motives. They're not doing it because they are different kind of people. This is not a good sociological argument because then, then there is nothing to study for sociology. Uh, so it is rather a distinctive pattern of institutional control of a wide range of motives which characterizes the behavior of scientists. So if, if you have, if you see a behavioral difference between institutions, uh, then you have to look for the causes of the difference in the institutions, norms and sanctions uh, of those domains. And we, uh, how do institutions enjoy those norms are true reward and punishment. So we uh, come to a familiar picture. So the, uh, according to Bridgestock, like sort of elaborates on the idea, uh, such values are reinforced according to a reward system within science that utilizes positive and negative sanctions to influence behavior. So positive rewards such as job security, promotion, citation, research grants, and honorific awards are, are given to those that adhere to the values of science. And in contrast, negative sections, sections such as dismissal, cessation of research, suspension of grant writing, are real against those subverting the common uh, set of scientific values. So they think uh, we have seen uh, quite many country examples. So the sociological argument resonates with the previous argument, as I said, that in maintaining that the scientific success deserves a structural explanation. So what I say against that. So the sociological argument uh, assumes that there is, uh, uh, let me put it differently. Merton says that what is important in explaining scientific success is scientific ethos, I would say, like the intellectual epistemic ethos in science. So that's the most significant factor. But I think that so he sort of reduces what we can understand from scientific ethos to a few institutional imperatives. So do research that, that way or, or, or the other way. So actually ethos is a much richer concept and it has not only top-down mechanisms, uh, which come from like sort of from the institutions to the scientists, so they determine the norms and the individual scientists comply. But there are lots of very important horizontal mechanisms for norm compliance, and this is not like something that we see in 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 that picture. One is peer normative pressure. I will elaborate on what I mean by this, and exemplars of of, of scientific virtue. So. We can see ethos alternatively as a collective endorsement of a lot sort of values, goals, and standards. So in terms of shared values, and you, you don't, you don't, uh, you cannot be said to share values if you are only like complying with them uh, in accordance with a reward and punishment scheme. So we have here uh, in like sort of my version, uh, underlining of, uh, in the endorsement of into, uh, scientific values. So what happens if you have a bad scientific ethos? Uh, it can be the case that epistemically deviant practices would meet little criticism or good practices could meet resistance. And we actually have an example of this in the case of uh, the credibility crisis. So we uh, see, for example, we, we saw many people say like in qualitative studies, but also uh, like I mean, on, on social media and interpersonally, that QRPs are like normalized misbehavior. Okay, we all sort of know that they are bad, uh, but it is so normalized, everybody does it, that, that it is also sort of like sort of doable or normal. 
uh, or people had a very sort of uh, wrong idea of how wrong they were. And I remember uh, the uh, famous paper by Simmons where they said that when they uh, began their sort of metal scientific research project, they thought that uh, practices which they sort of called p-hacking uh, were wrong, yeah, but they were uh, wrong in the way jay jaywalking was wrong. But they uh, found out that it was wrong in the way robbing a bank was wrong. So that also contributes to how a good or bad scientific ethos you have, because uh, bad or good practices would be valued with different intensity, I would say. Uh, so the other part we also have seen, like people finding out errors in the scientific literature or criticizing other people's methodological practices, for example, they would be taken quite personally and they would be like, uh, they would meet normative resistance, for example, like speaking about replication failures. That would, by many, uh, taken as that more interpersonal or moral behavior. This is not something you should do. This is like at least bad etiquette. Uh, but this is definitely bad for science because it undermines a critical culture. So if we uh, sort of uh, uh, represent uh, the shared values in terms of an epistemic ethos, then criticizing uh, people for raising epistemically justified points would uh, lead to a bad epistemic ethos from this very strict normative angle. So it might be bad for other reasons, but from this narrow angle, uh, it is bad for scientific ethos. So coming back to these uh, horizontal mechanisms, so the existence of epistemically virtuous scientists itself is a normative force, apart from what the institutions enjoy. Uh, because they train younger generations of scientists, they collaborate with other scientists, they contribute substantially to the scientific culture in their research environments. Uh, so they set sort of peer normative pressure on the other, on others. If you see things that, for example, engaging in QRP is sort of normalized, that pretty much everybody does it, then there's such a uh, huge gap between your injunctive norms and descriptive norms that like what, is, what, what ought to be the case and what is often the case is so wide apart uh, that that will definitely sort of undermine norm, norm compliance. And of course, uh, epistemic virtue sort of propagates through exemplars. This is like the old Aristotelian idea. Uh, we become virtuous uh, by looking at uh, other people's example that we that we sort of aspire towards, and this by itself is uh, a cause for uh, further norm, norm compliance. So norms cannot maintain their, their normative forms force only through reward and punishment. This is also in part because rewards don't incentivize virtue, but it's appearance. So, so this already creates a risk. Uh, in terms of non compliance and punishment in science is largely ineffective. We have been talking like during the breaks about this with many other people. Uh, we don't have punishment actually in science, and this is very difficult how to conceive we can have punishment for back practice in science. It is very rare and it's very inefficient as a mechanism. And externally motivated behavior tends to undermine norms when opportunity arises. An opportunity will always arise, as I said, because science is in part built on trust in a very essential way. Opportunity will always arise. One solution, tightening the institutional control, uh, is a bad idea, I think, because scientific autonomy is a very important force and a source for scientific progress. Uh, and it will be very inefficient, uh, like, for example, conducting a replication of each individual study that is published, it will be extremely inefficient. Uh, so high sub norm subscription, like endorsement uh, of norms, is something that would be something we would want at the collective level, then mere punishment awareness. Uh, and there are also like many studies which are pointing like in the same direction. Norm subscription is a very important predictor of refraining from PRP so, or uh, like worst case of mis misconduct. And if you if you your goal is to achieve an appearance of 
epistemic competence, it seems that uh, you are more likely to engage in QR PISA and, and vice versa. So yeah, my conclusion is that the credit economy and its structure may serve to increase the rate and speed of scientific discovery, but it doesn't serve collective epistemic interests or scientific progress unconditionally. The reliable knowledge generation and error elimination are not the kind of aims that can be achieved via external rewards. Uh, because any competitive reward system is a risk factor by itself for reliability and rigor uh, for all the values that we have in the context of justification. And institutional imperatives and san sanctions are not sufficient alone by themselves. So a good scientific ethos requires active stewardship. And uh, the, uh, that some people play also from time to time the role of guardians. So exemplars and guardians, I would say. Uh, in a quite medieval terminology. Uh, so we have scientists who are intrinsically concerned with adv advancing knowledge. There is no social mechanism to safeguard scientific institutions from epistemic corruption. And this is sort of sounds too strong. Uh, I can qualify it, but this is basically my conclusion. So I defended a, a status quo or a traditional position that individual virtue matters. Uh, I hope you've, I've convinced at least some of you. <laughs> Thanks. So it was uh, exactly as cool as I had. <laughs> yeah. uh, you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. This is wonderful. So I wanted to clarify something about how you understand um, this virtue radicalism that you uh, started out with. So I mean, as I understand that position, and I guess I'm sort of on record as you know. Doesn't like to get me. Yeah, sorry about that. I guess I'm sort of in print as you know one of the defenders of the possibility, at least, of virtue radicalism. I mean, I always took the idea to be that this is sort of a possibility, right? It can be done. Not that it's sort of pretty easy or that, you know, always when you get non-virtuous people together, the collective result is going to be virtuous. Whereas I took a lot of your arguments to show that, um, I mean, I, I don't think your arguments are arguments against the possibility of virtue radicalism. They show that it's pretty hard, or you know, in many cases, it doesn't work. So, is that is that correct? You think, or am I missing something important there? Yeah, I would say, like, I I, I don't have a like purely deductive, like, solid logical argument here. Like, it depends, at least in some part, on like on soundness and like persuading the, the audience. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess that question, like, on a very purely sort of deductive level. I guess it, we, we, we are not able to answer that. I, so it, this is like a very, diff, very difficult question to answer. So, and what, when we subscribe to sort of what I call virtue radicalism, it is also not on the basis of a sort of very firm uh, justified belief that this will work. It is more also like, a, uh, I would say, hope basically, or maybe an ideal uh, or a vision of like having scientific progress sort of uh, via almost automatic sort of mechanisms like by, but by engineering social structures and so on. It's almost like, a, I don't know, like a policymakers or tinkers dream that it will work this way, right? I guess there's sort of also like, uh, for this reason, lots of ideological sort of uh, motivations also like feeding into this because we want this to happen. If we manage to do this, Tinkering with incentives and so on. If people like uh, behaved and in a way that's open to uh, the, the influence of incentives in the ways we wanted, not in bad uh, sort of unpredictable ways, then yeah, we could achieve uh, awesome results with uh, at the collective level. Uh, but I wanted to raise some 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 uh, thoughts on why we can doubt. Uh, that this project would be successful. And yeah, like I've uh, been drawing on lots of the existing arguments uh, and I tried to build my argument in an indirect sort of uh, accumulative way. Ooh, accumulative way. Uh, but I yeah, personally think uh, that the human element, the individual factor uh, should be a salient uh, uh, factor in talking about such uh, issues like although it is really cool to talk about structures and their potential, uh, but we shouldn't be lose focus on uh, the individual because it is uh, 
it is where science actually happens at the individual level. I hope I answered. Uh, yeah, you're right. This is <laughs> this is the way my argument, how my argument is like yeah. exactly. Uh, so much. Um, I really liked your paper and was sympathetic towards the emphasis on the agency and the goodness. But I was wondering, in terms of how you started out with the turn towards the disenchantment, if there was a way to take on a little bit more of that, for example, in your slide that dealt with the three prototypes where you had the lawful good and then the chaotic good. And do you really need that lawful good, which was maybe the critique of the previous turn? And why isn't it sufficient just to sort of admit the chaotic good and encourage the good within the chaotic good of Research. Uh, so I was sort of yeah. interested in that formulation of, of what was Some important. Yeah. If you were sort of adding that that third initial category, which had previously been sort of discredited, and why you felt it was important to introduce that as opposed to working within the chaotic category. Um, yeah, I, I think we like most of the arguments, uh, like for English <laughs> hand mechanism or like related sort of arguments. They take this as their sort of prototype of, of the scientists, actually not this, although probably reality would be somewhere here, like these others are quite extremes. Uh, but like the traditional view had this as a prototype of, of the ideal scientist, and now we have this and you know, the real scientist is somewhere uh, in between. So since my argument was a criticism of the models, uh, sort of the perspective that takes this as their model, I wanted to emphasize that this has an important role to play. Uh, and if you have more of these people uh, in the scientific community, this will change this guy's uh, behavior. So that's sort of the argument, especially in response to Mert. Um, so like, the behavior of the chaotic good type, as I sort of envision it, is more flexible. So this is not very flexible. This is like indirect response to whatever you incentivize. So it is predictable. This is also predictable. So here is uh, the unpredictable part that we are all like talking about how we can improve scientist pra uh, practices without assuming that they're all evil or they're all like uh, noble inquiries, like normal people. Uh, but this flexibility is influenced by uh, which values are promoted and cherished within the community and to what extent and by how many people like to uh, how big a proportion of scientists in the community. So since this is our sort of realistic aim, uh, I think um, considering the other causal factors in terms of uh, what intellectual character distribution within the scientific population would help us. So that's what I wanted to sort of achieve. Like the norms you um, enjoin or the norms you promote as a scientific institution are not just like values or ideals, which are like up there, like the platonic ideals, but they're also in some sense selection pressures on intellectual characters, because then you are selecting for particular types and you are selecting sort of, you are receiving out certain types in the long term. So if you take that into account, uh, if you, if we, for example, focus too much on uh, value, values that are uh, related to the context of discovery, for example, as I say, uh, we will have uh, in time a different distribution of intellectual characters uh, in the scientific community. So that is something to reckon with. That's what I want to say. I'm, I guess I'm just skeptical of the first type. So if I thought I thought it would be more helpful if you focus on. So let me just <laughs> very little follow up points. So one of the points I wanted to make, and I guess I forgot uh, to make this uh, in, in, when I was talking about Merton to wrap this up, was that there are some positions in uh, sort of science, like uh, policy making positions, gatekeeping positions, like journal editors, science policy makers. Um, mentors and so on, full professors, PIs. Uh, some of these positions are uh, less uh, sort of exposed to the influence of incentives. So like, if you are an EC, early career researcher, for example, you are very open to their influence because a lot depends on that. Uh, but when you are like more, more senior, you are less, less open to that influence. And there are some positions in science 
uh, then you definitely wouldn't want people who are responding directly to credit incentives. But do you have a different set of incentives for these people to shape their behavior? No, you actually don't. Uh, so you actually have to rely on these people's good judgment and values uh, in those crucial positions. And that's why you definitely need to have a pool of uh, lawful good scientists, especially for those positions. Uh, because otherwise, like you have, you cannot have any like uh, collective level planning or policy making, uh, which sort of in, uh, includes how these people would uh, behave in those positions. And if those people are like purely career oriented, uh, where where you really want them to make virtuous interventions from time to time, uh, yeah, I guess that's that's a path to uh, epistemic corruption, as I say in like, words. Um, yeah, sure, yeah. All right, thanks so much. I really enjoyed that. Um, right, uh, so I've got a question or uh, maybe uh, two, well, really a positive suggestion about um, the distinction you made at the outset and just made it kind of uh, so rather radically interesting. So, um, so I thought there may be a bit of uh, more nuance or subtlety which would actually strengthen your position. Two regards. So, the first regard is why wouldn't we distinguish between the size of groups and the division of labor. So I can imagine that if you're a small research group, six people and one person does the collection of data, the other person does the analysis of data, right? You've got this division. If one person is narrow-minded, it's really hard for the entire group as a group mm -hmm. to be open-minded, right? So there, one person's bias screws the entire group. They can't have the difference, right? And you can think of some, some similar for biases. Whereas if you think of, say, the entire community of theoretical physicists, with lots of research groups, it's good if some groups are dogmatic, highly dogmatic, and others like exploring new ideas, right? And so, so therefore, the group as a whole is a good thing if some members are dogmatic. That doesn't defeat the open mindedness of the group as a group, right? Because the division of tasks and the size is different. So that would kind of qualify things. And the second regard in which you can qualify this is maybe by this making the well known distinction between low and high fidelity virtues and vices. Right. So some virtues and vices require a lot of consistency, right? For instance, you're open-minded only if you are so on many occasions. But other virtues or vices are low fidelity. So if I torture my patients on only 5% of the occasion, <laughs> I'm still cruel. Yeah. If even if I do so only in five groups, you see where I'm heading? Yeah. Um, and this also applies to intellectual uh, virtues and vices. Um, and if they require less consistency. That is compatible with more members in the group not having that virtue or not having the bias. So that will kind of make the picture way more subtle. And also it will make it easier to connect it with empirical research rather than this question like, is it possible for a group to be virtuous, even if not all members are? Yes, it's probably yes, yes. All right, right? Yeah. I, 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 like, I see what you're getting at. Yeah, definitely. Like having more, like having more structural elements into uh, this argument and seeing how they combine with individual factors uh, to bring about collective uh, epistemic virtues. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, especially with the difference between high fidelity and low fidelity, like concept. <coughs> yeah, that might definitely play a role here. For example, diligence. Like we, when it applies to like methodological rigor and so on. So most of the values that I identified in the context of justification there, low fidelity values, yeah. Uh, so like if you have a bad study, it doesn't mean that you will have like most of many other good studies, definitely. Thanks a lot. Uh, I hadn't participated in the discussions uh, about punishment. I, I, now that you pointed it out, I thought it was really interesting. And it made me think about, because we were talking about lawful good as people who have intrinsic motivation for seeking out truth, uh, roughly. And uh, it, it reminded me of the pedagogist education philosopher Montessori, where she talks about how she observed when you remove rewards and punishments from young children's environments, it actually increases the likelihood that they will have intrinsic motivation. Uh, it fosters their intrinsic motivation because when you use rewards and punishments, it changes it to external motivation. For example, when I praise a child for what they're doing, 
they will first they did it because I'm exploring this thing and I think it's really cool and then I tell them wow you made a beautiful artwork and then they start copying making the same artwork they stop exploring they want to get the praise and that turns it into an external uh, motivation and she philosophizes that the behavior she observes is due to our need to survive so as children we need to explore we need to learn from our environment to adapt to the society we're in so we can survive uh we, we have a drive towards perfection we want to do things better and better and better and she says when we introduce rewards and punishments we can see results but they kind of suppress the intrinsic motivations that give our, our work much more life in a way. And she, she refers to observation of really young children. And she says later on, these forces may not happen. But I do wonder to a certain extent if it does still for us as adults, because we still have some flexibility there. And sometimes even if we started out intrinsically uh, lawful good, it might shift our priorities and our behaviors towards the other good. It's yeah, this, this, thank, thank you very much. Like, this is not something that I took into consideration, although, like, my understanding of intrinsic concern for truth is roughly similar to an intrinsic motivation as opposed to an external uh, motivation by, by, let's say, reward and punishment. Uh, and I took sort of the adult scientist as less flexible. In, in, so this is a de developmental perspective, definitely. Uh, so my thinking was more in terms of creating sort of niches within, uh, more niches within the sort of scientific community for intrinsically motivated people, because since like now the whole focus is on external rewards and punishments and so on, this by itself is a selection pressure against in intrinsically motivated people. And uh, I mean, at least anecdotally, I see many uh, more leave academia. Uh, because they like don't fit uh, in, in its sort of uh, scientific culture. Uh, but I guess what you say has um, some relevance to uh, what many early career researchers uh, sort of say about their experience in academia, that they enter into science with their noble aspirations and so on. But then as they get used to how things are done, they find themselves after some decades in a place where their values are not uh, oriented with their initial intentions and they sort of uh, feel a uh, <coughs> motivational vacuum. So th this I've heard from many young scientists. So there might be maybe a possibility for drawing this sort of developmental comparison. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't mean that incent uh, incentives are completely useless, but I, I feel like they, they can be used in uh, when we keep revising them as what are the top goals that we have for incentives as um, I think not just to improve the quality of our work, for example, through methods of uh, collaboration uh, to increase the social relevance of our work, because when we're so into something, we may not think of that uh, as rules of, of the game. So because this is an economic livelihood activity that we're trying to engage in. And, and so we, we cannot completely remove people who, who want who have different motivations. And it may not be wise to do so either, but uh, yeah, just considering that part. But it, as as you said, it's it's kind of interesting to to also be able to make sure that there's enough space for people who are. That's sort of yeah, look at the crux of my argument as well. Like yeah, we we all emphasize diversity and like in respect to many topics like cognitive cognitive diversity, yeah, like diversity in epistemic strategies and so on. Uh, but in the end, since we have like one reward <coughs> system, which is like uh, not very diverse, like a single normative system sort of in the credit economy, uh, it only applies to like uh, ex sort of externally motivated sort of behavior. Uh, we are also like shaping uh, the uh, population of scientists towards uh, being consists of more of externally motivated scientists and we, we are diminishing niches for other uh, sort of sources of uh, motivation. Um, okay, I just want to say Maybe one, we transition this? 
Yeah, so like uh, um, uh, we have 15 minutes left for uh, in the last session, essentially. Um, I would like to open it to also further questions about other talks yes. of, of this day and maybe also in, of the whole seminar in total, like any reflections and questions to other people. We can, you can continue <laughs> asking a dream room question, it's also totally yeah, fine. And before we do that, just before I forget, I wanted to mention that I found this charger for a MacBook yesterday that was in the back. So if this is uh, one of you is um, having a heavy kid, that's, that's all. Okay. Um, <laughs> Listen, so, my that's... context if somebody wants to. <laughs> okay. Um, Mike. Thanks, Diego. This is a, a great talk. Um, and, you know, we have a, a large degree of agreement, I think, both in our diagnosis of like problems in actual science and in how philosophers of science have um, sort of developed this invisible hand argument and the problems of the invisible hand argument. Um, you know, if I was, and I also really like to focus on like the individual virtues of scientists. I think there's something quite right there. If I was gonna kind of like argue for my crazier proposals over, over what you're arguing for, it would be that um, yes, it's not just structure that matters, um, ethos matters too, but I think there's quite a like complex relationship between structure and ethos, and that a kind of entrepreneurial ethos is very much baked in to the current structure of academic research, and changing the ethos, changing how scientists self-conceptualize is actually gonna require fairly radical changes to what a scientific career looks like, what institutions of research look like, and, and so on. You can't really get one without the other. Definitely, but it, the, the scientific ethos has changed radically already uh, from the times that you have uh, mentioned of this disenchantment. Uh, before that, we didn't have this entrepreneurial scientific climate, or uh, so the values, the set of shared values and norms were quite different. So we had this radical change. And now we are talking about, at least most of us, uh, about radical problems. And I don't know, maybe radical problems require radical changes because radical changes brought about radical problems from my perspective. <laughs> um, this is the kind of thing that I wouldn't have, wouldn't there have uh, question questions about without thinking about them a lot. So more uh, uh, clarification question about uh, just lawful good and, and stuff like that. Yeah, so just to be sure, you define epistemic virtuousness as having the primary goal or motivator of you know uh, pursuing truth, right? Not your, maybe as your defining character as a human being, but in your research behavior at least. So from my perspective, I'm not talking about like an exemplary individual in all respects. So it is conceptually, totally possible to have an epistemically virtuous person who is more of the vicious like for me these are different things yeah. that's i what that's why I, why I wanted to have like responsibility as it is relevant to research <laughs> as an epistemic concept in difference to moral qualities some people see it as moral but like we can have morally bad individuals who are epistemically good uh, so that's what i had in mind so so your research behavior is whatever honest transparent rigorous so you do research in a way that reflects and aim to reach uh, good scientific results. So that's all what I mean. But you can be a totally nasty person and you can be horrible company to, to be with. That's perfectly like uh, conceivable. Yeah, and continuing that to, to this, uh, because I take memes very seriously, you know, to, and to understand why um, how your conceptualization of, of lawfulness versus goodness here. Because in this meme, usually these two things these are, are orthogonal, <laughs> really supposed to be independent. And as far as I see here in, in your conceptualization, when you move from lawful good to chaotic good, it seems like the goodness decreased and not the lawfulness. In this, if you see the if you see the, the, the incentive structure and the, and the norms as the law, your and then you can see the um, thinking of these things when doing science as being lawful. And so, yeah, intuitively, I would see the, the chaotic good as being the person who, who is really interesting, interested in, in, in pursuing the truth at all costs and less interested in, in these 
No, it makes sense. sense. Yeah, it makes sense from a more like maybe uh, proficient D and D perspective. Yeah, it makes sense. So when I conceived this, my idea was like basically, if you're lawful, you have like a single salient motivation in explaining one type of behavior. But if you're chaotic, you have multiple motivations that go into explaining that or are influencing that behavior. So that was my idea. Of course, you can also have like lawful evil. I guess that might also find some representation, but this is this was irrelevant to the debate. So that's how I understood it. Uh, but yeah, I see where you're coming from. So uh, like pursuing your ends irrespective of the global or like societal ends. Yeah. Let's uh, talk about this later. Uh, so how we can optimize the DMP structure. Uh, um, yeah, maybe. Thanks. Uh, interesting talk. Um, so I'm not too much acquainted with the uh, uh, the soft goal, uh, but I can also see some clear relations to what uh, uh, you just presented this morning. Fitness landscapes, I should probably say. Um, but I was wondering about that in that regard. Um, so your argument is, as far as I understand, that we need, let's say, some virtues. Some individual purchase people in order to guarantee that a community stays. Not guarantee, but it's a necessary condition, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I'm having a difficulty in um, understanding what it implies because we're still having to deal with the question of how do we get these virtuous people actually. Which depends on still incentive structures, I'd say. Um, yeah. I, I, would, I, I would imagine like incentive structures are usually conceived at a behavioral level. Like uh, you have this set set of, let's say, scientists who are like behavioral flexible, and you set certain incentives, and they respond to those incentives behaviorally. But when it comes to intellectual character types, I guess uh, it is more a matter of having niches for these people to. Uh, survive, thrive, or get eliminated within this uh, scientific community in, in within its like sort of credit economy. So that's uh, what I had in mind. Like you, I guess you cannot completely convert somebody who is like a chaotic neutral to somebody who, who is like lawful. Good. But what you can do is to when you train scientists and when you promote scientists, when you hire new scientists, you can have. Uh, at least certain niches or more focus on um, diversity on that end. Like if you have like a single set of um, job hiring criteria, promotion criteria, award uh, allocation criteria, and so, so on. Like in a single set, I mean uh, a set which sort of favors uh, chaotic neutral uh, scientists to thrive. Uh, then you are maybe inadvertently placing this negative selection pressure against a lawful good scientist. So like you are not selecting that type. So you on your terms, they are incompetent or unreliable. So you are hiring them less, you're promoting them less, you're like them kicking them uh, off of academia or you're creating a climate where they don't feel good about what they're doing or where they feel really bad about what all the others are doing and they sort of give up. So that's, that is sort of what I mean. Yeah, like you cannot completely create people, uh, their personalities with incentive structures. You can only like make differences in their behavior if they are sufficiently open to such an influence. Uh, but definitely we are also selecting, uh, when we are looking for traits, when you are looking for certain skills, abilities and so on, by the values we, Sort of promote, we are also selecting for intellectual character types. That's what I wanted to bring about. But still, we, we should think about the incentive structures and just we need to make sure that they also select for exactly like sort of the broader influence of incentive structures on the population of intellectual characters within science. So that's what sort of what I'm trying to get at. There's not an argument against, let's say, the type of thing. No, 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 no. They, they definitely have a place, a uh, role to play. Uh, although I haven't told about it at all, I, I took it for granted. Uh, yeah. And one brief remark and then on virtues. I think it came in your discussion because the postdocs being disenchanted with now they find out how it really worked. I think that's largely because we treat our students so nicely. So that we never tell them what's going on. You know, you're important and this is the greatest time of your life. And then 10 years later, they all win. 
So education still has those values in place. <laughs> um, for better or worse, we, we tell them very late how it really is. Um, on, <laughs> on the other thing with the virtues, I'm on board with virtues, but not, not every deviant behavior, I think, needs to be explained exclusively by a lack of virtue, partly mm. because, you know, faking the signal, if you didn't have to fake if you had the virtue. It's be costly, at least in the long run, but it's, the economists will tell you that it's hard to see why you actually do it. That's the immediate thing. Yeah. So alternatively, if you look at, look at Aristotle, and you know, courage is a great virtue. You, you wake up in the morning, you're going to go be courageous today. So there's a challenging situation. Now you have to know how to do it, how to be courageous. So you have to have, there's a cognitive component to it. So the suggestion is that uh, what you might explain for lack of virtue is actually a lack of knowledge of how to do it better. Definitely, yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's actually the uh, the this had had to do with the concept. The concept is not like a, a single factor concept. Actually, it has components, and uh, like I try to have a more general uh, concept of epistemic virtue that will be acceptable to many. But there are lots of disputes in the virtue epistemology of what virtue means or should mean. And I wanted to combine these two core elements of competence and responsibility. Some people place the focus totally on competence. Some people place the focus on uh, responsibility and even think that like when you have good intentions, even if you are not skilled enough, you will be virtuous and so on. But definitely uh, my concept is uh, more, uh, I would say, uh, fluctuating, uh, I, I guess, or, or like unstable, depending on the context. Definitely what you say is true. Like there, it is not only a motivational sort of consideration, definitely. There's a crucial cognitive consideration that goes into that. I didn't talk about that that much because it was like less relevant for the arguments, but definitely uh, if you are uh, cognitively lacking, uh, if the field is cognitive. If field is yeah. definitely, the, like for example, that example, uh, that uh, the example uh, having to do with peer hacking, for example, if you don't know, like, if you don't have the meta analysis and so on, if you don't have the meta science, uh, and if you don't know like the collective level consequences of a peer hack literature, if you only focus on uh, like your in individual outcomes, you definitely don't know how bad it is, definitely. Then you have like false beliefs uh, or a false idea of goodness or badness. And this definitely counts, uh, the, the, that definitely undermines virtue. And there's definitely a very safe and cognitive element, although I didn't like uh, emphasize it that much because these people like the invisible hand argument and so on, they focus more on the motivational element. That, that's why. Definitely, you're right. Um, we just, uh, I just wanted to emphasize this point because I find it very um, intuitive. Like, I've, I've, I feel like I've come across this many times in psychology. It's, it's everywhere that there are methods that uh, some people have shown or can show are terrible and almost everyone in the field just doesn't know. And then sometimes those methods are so central to a subfield that they refuse to give it up. Yeah, even if it's definitely. pointed out, so because it would definitely. be, yeah, it would like definitely. Uh, but yeah, yeah, like here at this point, I can only say with my like this almost exclusive focus on motivations that we have been like people have been not not me, but people have been publishing a lot about like bad research methods, for example, bad research practices, questionable research practices, that like it sort of updated our knowledge and beliefs about like uh, the consequences of these actions, right? Uh, how much behavioral change did we see? Like, if we had like uh, all virtuous scientists, like as a let's say model assumption, you would expect to get a perfect change in behavior. But like, there is reluctance. How do you explain that reluctance? So that's sort of my point. Uh, thank you. Super interesting. Um, it, related a little bit to your point. I was wondering when you drew up the sort of we have these three types of scientists and we also need to consider and and value um, the other two types. I was wondering, do we not also need a type that more embodies virtues like collaboration or a desire for harmony, especially for the other ones to sustain in the long run? Yeah, 
Yeah, it's, it's that, that, that's definitely a point that I will uh, like refer to, like Leo's work that he like mentioned. Uh, he doesn't talk, talk totally about that, but he like his work on on group selection, like shifting the level of selection in science. Yeah, I mean, uh, opening up more niches for uh, different motivations. Uh, like in the paper, I have some passages on that. I also cite a lot uh, that we have to diversify the motivation. Sort of pool, but also like the skill pool. So uh, we shouldn't cons co uh, like focus only on uh, in, in skills that are fit for individual for making individually successful sort of research projects, but like skills that fit into like collective research projects or uh, that make an indirect contribution to collective success. Uh, although they are like sort of individual uh, skills. So that's definitely an, ar an argument. So the, I the idea of like en enlarging niches for uh, like virtuous people also had uh, a consideration if I can get it right and sort of uh, consistent enough. It also involves the idea of having a more divergent uh, competence set, set definitely. I think uh, we've come to the end. Um, so uh, I want to yeah, thank everybody here, everybody who came, all of our speakers, all of our fossil presenters, lightning talk presenters, uh, everyone helped with the organization, our uh, assistants, Marianne and Josh. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Samira van der Lowe, our previous project manager, who uh, isn't here anymore, but like initiated uh, the organization to this, and of course our uh, fund, the Temple of Templeton. Uh, World Charity uh, Foundation. And uh, yeah, thank you to all of you for all these fascinating discussions we had and all these great talks. <laughs>